canned tuna. Today, it's a very important source of protein worldwide. But have you ever thought about how it gets all the way to your kitchen? The canning industry is completely globalized. Tuna is fished in one ocean, processed in a completely different part of the world, labeled in yet another, and then makes several more stops before it's sold in retail stores. Knowing more about its journey makes us better informed consumers and reinforces our commitment to safe, sustainable food. In this Planet Tuna video, we'll help you understand the information available to you and shed some light on how a can of tuna is produced from the moment the fish is caught until it appears in your kitchen. This is The Journey of a Can of Tuna. We've divided the journey into six parts. Let's have a look at the first one. If you look at what a label tells you, in addition to the usual things, you'll see that some companies also give information on the species, the area where it was caught, or the fishing gear they used. But this information isn't regulated. It's optional, so you won't always see it or know how to interpret it. There's a lot of useful information that is not on the label and that may not be available elsewhere either. For example, let's see if you can answer this simple question. What's inside a can of tuna? It's a trick question. Tuna, right? Yeah, but what kind? You'll see it's almost impossible to find out. Among all the species of tuna, the three that are fished the most and are likeliest to end up in a can of tuna are skipjack, the most highly fished species, yellowfin, and big eye. All three are referred to as tropical tunas. They're very productive species, especially skipjack, because it only takes them a few years to reach maturity. Even so, populations are constantly being evaluated to avoid overfishing. And how is that done? The label includes an FAO area and a number. It refers to zones that the UN has established in the oceans to provide better control of our fishing resources. So, if we know where the tuna was fished, and to that we add information provided by various international organizations, we can find out whether the tuna did or didn't come from a place that's overfished. According to the data for 2021, big eye tuna is at risk in the Atlantic, and yellowfin tuna is at risk in the Indian Ocean. As data about catches vary from one year to the next, and the different organizations make assessments and take measures to avoid overfishing on an ongoing basis, it's important to check up-to-date sources. You'll find some links below. Now that you know which the possible species are and where they were caught, you can look up the status of their populations in that area. Next, let's have a look at how they're caught. Almost 70% of the world's tuna are fished with purse seine gear. The schools of fish are surrounded by huge nets that are closed and pulled up like a giant bag. Almost all purse seiner fleets use fads. Fads are floating platforms that drift along and signal their position with GPS technology. FAD is the acronym for Fish Aggregating Device, or DCP in Spanish. Although the fads are very simple devices, for some mysterious reason they make for increased catches. We don't know why fish gather in large numbers in their shadow. They can have negative effects, such as catching non-target species and juveniles, as well as generating marine litter. That's why an effort is being made to minimize their impact by eliminating nets in their construction and by using biodegradable materials. Even with the help of fads, this purse seiner may spend up to three months at sea before its freezer storage units are full. Then it goes back to port. This stage is short and fast. The boats reach the landing ports. On the map, you can see the ones that the Spanish and other associated fleets use. When the boats reach one of these ports, they unload and sell tons of tuna. Canneries from many different places buy the tuna in daily auctions. For the most part, the tuna is unloaded in containers that are then moved onto trucks or ships, again, and arrive at the processing plants following a more or less direct route. And here we are at last, at the cannery. For tuna to go in one end, and cans to come out the other, a lot has to happen along the way. First, the fish is received and sorted while it's still frozen. Some canneries keep information about the species, where it was caught, and how, Others don't. 
Next, it's partially thawed so it can be cleaned and cut. Up to 50% of each tuna ends up in byproducts such as fish oils and fish meal. The rest, the prettiest part of the tuna, is steamed and left to cool. We saw before that not all canneries include information about the species or place where the fish was caught. But at this point in the canning process, when the steamed tuna is separated into smaller pieces, it's even harder to guarantee that the contents of a can belongs to one single fish. These small pieces are gathered up and shaped to fit into the can. Then the can is filled with oil or sauce, and once it's sealed, it's heat sterilized and packed to be sent on to the next client in the chain. The can leaves the factory for the last leg in its journey. Distribution. There are so many stopovers and resales along the way that it's almost impossible to follow the course of each can. But what's for sure is that it will eventually reach a store where you can buy it knowing that you're at least a bit better informed. So now you're aware of the global dimension of a can of tuna, and you can see how much information is still missing if we want to be responsible consumers. We need legislation requiring that all the necessary information be on the label. Thanks for watching, and see you again soon on Planet Tuna. Thank <laughs> you.